Late Night Stargazing, now on BBC One with Patrick Moore. Most of this programme, we're going to go down under. But first of all, one or two news notes. I'm sure you've seen the five bright planets in the western sky after sunset. Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and for a time, Mercury and the Moon too, and that lovely picture taken by Lou Marsh. Of course, this conjunction is merely a line of sight effect. It doesn't mean anything, but it was rather lovely and won't happen again for some time. And on May the 16th, the planet Saturn actually passed behind the Moon and was occulted. And there we see Saturn just after immersion coming out from behind the Moon. There it is on the right-hand side. That picture taken with my telescope, my observatory, by Tim Wright. And note how small Saturn appears compared with the Moon. It's quite interesting. Also, we've had a comet. Comet Ekeya Zhang. This picture taken by Martin Mobley. Not a hail bop by any means, but it did reach naked eye visibility, had quite a nice tail. Interesting thing, it's been seen before. It was seen in 1661, and therefore this is the comet with the longest period to have been seen at more than one return. Also, the sun has been playing up. Here we have what we call a CME, or coronal mass ejection, material hurled away from the sun, taken there by the SOHO satellite. Interesting because the Sun should now be past the peak of its 11-year cycle of activity. And do look at this picture, a very famous one, taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, the Eagle Nebula, said to be a stellar nursery, with new stars being formed inside those marvellous columns of gas. But is it? There's a suggestion now, this may not be so, there may not be much star-forming material there, and may have got it wrong. Frankly, I'm a bit wary about this, and I think we need more research coming from the Chandra satellite. We must wait and see. And now, on to our main theme. Before the 20th century, almost all astronomy came from the Northern Hemisphere. Well, things are different now, and the emphasis has gone south, for two reasons. First of all, the southern skies are clearer. Secondly, they have better stars. We can't see the Southern Cross, for example. And there are great observatories now in the Southern Hemisphere. In Australia, the main observatory is at Siding Spring in New South Wales, well north of Sydney. And uh, the sky at night has been there several times. This is a timeless place where kangaroos and koalas roam at night. And it seems hardly to have changed since these volcanoes were finally quietened 13 million years ago. But this is Siding Spring Mountain, the home of one of the most sophisticated pieces of modern engineering. This is the dome of the Anglo-Australian Telescope, or AAT. It dominates the scene. It's 150 feet high, and it and the telescope weigh over 7,000 tons. Fortunately, it's built on firm foundations. These ancient volcanoes are very solid indeed. One's used to thinking of observatories perched on the tops of mountains. Well, there are no really high mountains in Australia, but Siding Spring, at well over 4,000 feet, is quite lofty, and conditions here are good. Well, the present astronomer in charge is Professor Fred Watson, an old friend of the sky at night and a very dear friend of mine. Welcome back, Fred. Delighted to see you. Thank you, Patrick. First of all, can you say something about the AAO, the AAT, and the UKS? I will indeed. They are the, the three uh, main sets of initials that dictate my entire life, Patrick. The AAO is the Anglo-Australian Observatory, which has existed for almost 30 years to provide with its two telescopes, the AAT, the 3.9 meter Anglo-Australian telescope, and the UKS, which is the 1.2 meter UK Schmidt telescope, uh, to provide research facilities of world-class quality, principally to British and Australian astronomers. And we've done that uh, at Siding Spring Observatory. Uh, we have, of course, concentrated on the 
dark skies of the southern hemisphere, uh, partly because of the objects that we see from down there. We can see, uh, for example, the very brightest part of the Milky Way, which corresponds with the galactic centre. And here we see mm. one of David Malin's stunning yeah. portraits of nebulosity within the Milky Way, we taken, in fact, with the Anglo-Australian telescope. We can't see that, unfortunately. No, you, no, that's true. But uh, in Australia, it passes almost overhead. We are also blessed in the south with the nearest of our neighbour galaxies. And there are two very bright nearby galaxies, uh, uh, the large and small Magellanic Clouds. And this picture, again, uh, by David Mellin, although taken with the UK Schmidt Telescope, shows the large Manic Magellanic Cloud at a distance of about 165,000 light years from our own galaxy. The, the two telescopes are uh, situated in the beautiful Warren Bungles range. You might not know that Warren Bungle is a word in the local Aboriginal dialect, and it means crooked mountains. Uh, and it's a very apt description. Uh, th these mountains are about uh, 20 miles from the small town of Coonabarabran. It's in a lovely sight. I saw my first koala bear there. You would indeed, yes. We have koalas in abundance. <laughs> well, you mentioned the UK Schmidt telescope. Can you say a bit about that? Yes, the Schmidt uh, is the smaller of the observatory's two telescopes in physical size, in terms of uh, the diameter of its lens and mirror. But it has a particular attribute, which is that it's got a very wide angle of view. And this telescope was built in the early 1970s with the express purpose of doing a survey of the entire southern sky by taking photographs to map the sky, essentially. Uh, there's a delightful portrait of the Schmidt from its early days here, which shows uh, Fred Hoyle, a yes. youthful looking Fred Hoyle on the left hand side of the photograph there. Um, it uh, was built in fact under the auspices of the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh but in 1988 became uh, part of the Anglo-Australian Observatory. Let's come back now Camry to the AAT. Of course it takes magnificent pictures but it now carries out surveys in other ways too. Yes there are more ways of surveying the sky than just by looking at it. And back in the early 1980s, the two telescopes of the AAO were instrumental in forging a new type of astronomy uh, which uses fiber optics. The fibers are used to transport light from the stars and galaxies in the focus of the telescope to a thing we call a spectrograph. Which in other words, you can just feed the light down a tube. It's tubes of light, that's right. We, we do indeed. And the tubes are flexible. So it has the beauty that we can place these fibers on any particular objects in the field field of view. Uh, that started in the 1980s, but towards the end of the 1990s, the AAT uh, was equipped with an instrument called 2DF, which stands for two degree field, and that is the size of sky, or the amount of sky that this instrument can see. It's more than for any other four meter class telescope. Here's a picture of 2DF on uh, what we call the top end of the AAT. Uh, you can see it's a very complex piece of equipment, but it has the, uh, the property that it can observe 400 objects simultaneously and observe them in great detail. And what's all this telling us? Uh, what we've done is we've used that instrument uh, to carry out a survey of a quarter of a million galaxies in the local universe, out to a distance of about two and a half billion light years. Uh, this survey has just finished, in fact. Uh, we didn't quite make it to a quarter of a million. We finished at 221,416. But it's still a good number of galaxies. How long, it, how long did it take you? It's taken about five years. Uh, but the, the astonishing thing that's come from that, uh, five years of, of rather arduous work for the people involved with the survey. Including you? Um, I've played my small part, yes. Uh, but we, uh, what's come out of that is uh, sort of new information about no less than eight different cosmological parameters, things that tell us about the history and evolution of the universe. Um, and it includes particularly information about the dark matter in the universe. What is dark matter? Well, uh, that's the $64,000 question, Patrick. <laughs> dark matter is something that uh, embarrasses astronomers because yeah. we don't know what it is. <laughs> and it constitutes at least 90% of the universe. But what the 2DF uh, Galaxy Survey has told us is that whatever it is, only something like 13 or 14 percent of it can be made up by massive neutrinos, which are tiny subatomic particles. How do you find that out? 
It just comes from an analysis of the positions of all these galaxies. Now, the way the survey works is we've looked at two areas of the sky which are above and below the plane of our Milky Way galaxy. Uh, and we've sort of looked in two pie slices out towards the north and south galactic poles. And then once we've done the measurements of where these galaxies are, we can actually plot the positions of the galaxies uh, in three dimensions. So we end up with, with a map, uh, almost like a cross-section of the universe. And, and this fiery red image that's on the screen screen now shows exactly that. It's essentially a cross-section of the universe out to about two and a half billion light years in the northern and southern directions. Because you've been putting new bits of equipment onto the UK Schmidt, haven't well, you? Well, we have indeed, because um, the Schmidt telescope can do something rather similar to that. But rather than looking in two pie slices, we can look at the whole of the southern sky. And so we've built an instrument at the Schmidt telescope, which is called 6DF. It stands for six degree field. And again, it uses fiber optics. Uh, here's the instrument itself with a very clever robot between two even cleverer commissioning scientists, Will Saunders on the left, Quentin Parker on the right, who had the arduous task of commissioning 60F. But what 60F is going to do is a survey of the redshifts and velocities of about 100,000 galaxies over the whole southern sky. Well, that's quite a task, isn't it? It takes a long time. We all know telescope time is valuable. How much telescope time have you got for this project? Well, we've uh, been very generous, in fact, and, and it's, not, it's not really a, a question of generosity. The, the fact is that this project is the keynote project for the Schmidt telescope over the next uh, two to three years. And so the, the uh, 60F Galaxy Survey has got 75% of all time on the telescope. You have got a lot of telescope time. What are the main things you hope to learn from it, Fred? Well, there are two things that will come out of this survey. Um, first of all, what's called the redshift map, and that is essentially allows us to map the positions of these 100,000 or so galaxies in space in three dimensions. But secondly, we will, for a subset of them, uh, measure their velocities. That's to say, the individual mm. velocities that each galaxy have. In the trade, it's called peculiar velocities, yeah, yes. but they're not peculiar, no. they're just peculiar to the objects. And that will tell us something about the bulk mass flows uh, within the local universe, out to about um, half a billion light years. And that, in turn, again, sheds light on dark matter. It tells us about the way things yeah. are being pulled around. And, of course, you do this by using spectra. Spectra, indeed. Uh, the system, what it does is plots uh, on, essentially on a screen, uh, an image of all the 150 spectra of each of the galaxies that it's looking at simultaneously. And we get an image that looks rather like a, a fax that's gone wrong. It does. It is a, a, very, a very significant fax. It is. It's a very significant fax, indeed, and it's come a long way. <laughs> but um, if you could imagine this uh, illustration in colour, uh, on the left you would have deep violet and on the right you would have deep red and each horizontal bright line is the spectrum uh, the spectral signature of an individual galaxy and there are 150 of those um, across them from top to bottom are lines of light that come from features in the Earth's atmosphere in fact things like oxygen and hydroxyl um, but the question you might ask is why are they all neatly piled one on top of one another like that and the answer to that is it's the most efficient way to use the detector this is the most effective way of looking at 150 objects at a time what is the real ultimate aim of the 60f survey well we want to cover not just a small amount of the sky but the whole of the southern sky to to to, to get a, a good idea of exactly what the conditions are and in fact uh, the maps uh, that we we show um, in fact we show these on our website to let people see progress with yes, the survey yeah. at the top you can see the the targets on the sky that we're going to observe that's a sort of map of the southern sky and at the bottom uh, are the fields that we've observed already with 60f each little circle on there is a six degree field of sky that has been observed with the instrument and for which we now have data. I don't know if I can give a, a precise answer to this one, but how many red shifts have you got altogether? Uh, altogether it will be in the region of a hundred thousand and we're, we're somewhere at like a tenth uh, to a uh, 
perhaps a tenth to an eighth of the way through that. How long has it taken you? Well, we've been working on this for a year, but of course we were struggling with commissioning for quite a, lot, a long peri period of the first year. But um, we expect that we'll be completed by around 2004. You know, one thing does strike me, Fred. We know the AAT in the UK are splendid telescopes. I know I've seen them many times, but by modern standards, they're not really big, are they? They're not indeed. And in fact, um, you know, they, these are small, modest-sized telescopes on a site that by world class standards has to be considered indifferent um, but at the same time they're used in ways that are quite unique so we're using this multi-fiber technique to uh, allow us to explore a niche in astronomy that no one else is doing and in fact we have even bigger plans for the Schmidt telescope uh, we would like uh, once this galaxy survey is over to begin a survey of the stars in our galaxy and we are aiming to measure the velocities, the individual velocities of up to a million stars in our own galaxy. A very ambitious idea. It is indeed. And how, how long will that take, do you reckon? We think we'll be talking about at least five years for that. It's a long-term project, but it, it gives the telescope a future, of course. Another point, too. We've been talking about the results we've got so far, but there are plenty of interesting spin-offs, aren't there? Things one wouldn't expect. There, there are, yes. We have, uh, because we, we build robots, which are extremely clever pieces of equipment and are, are able to do very unusual things, the 6DF robot, for example, can, can pick up and move a fibre and put it down again with an accuracy of a hundredth of a millimetre in about 10 seconds. And this has led uh, people in other areas of endeavour to wonder whether their applications in, and in particular I'm talking to people at the Queensland University of Technology who are interested in medical physics about the possibilities of adapting uh, the AAO's robot technology towards medical applications. Well of course people don't realize how closely astronomy and space research are linked up with other sciences. People forget that don't they? They do and, and we have real practical benefits coming from this science that's right. Well you've been involved from the start Fred and you've been coming to the sky at night now for a long time we've known each other for many years so yeah. What is your immediate future? What are you doing now? Um, I'm about to go uh, to Germany to talk about the million star survey that we've just been talking about and then back to Australia to keep going with the 6DF galaxy survey and hopefully in a few years time to be measuring the spectra of stars. And one last question. Uh, you have the, your telescopes there and the infants and them. Are you planning any larger telescopes outside in spring? Uh, there are new telescopes going to Siding Spring, but not larger. It's my view, and I suspect all Australian astronomers' view, that the Anglo-Australian telescope, the 3.9 metre telescope, will remain the largest telescope in Australia, simply because if you're going to invest $100 million, as you have to, in an 8 metre class telescope, you want it to be on the very best site you can get. And sadly, uh, for that you need a high mountain and higher than the ones we have in Australia. So I think the Anglo-Australian telescope is it. Well, it does show what can be done with a fairly modest telescope when it's well run. Congratulations to you all. It's been lovely to see you, Fred. Come back again soon and tell us what's going on at Siding Spring. It will be my pleasure, Patrick. Thank you Thanks so much. much. Thank you. And now, um, remember, if you want the latest astronomical information, you can dial up our website, www.bbc.co.uk slash space, or CFAX page 620. And from our website, May I give a very big thank you to all of you who sent in congratulatory messages after our programme last month for our 45th anniversary. I've had hundreds of messages, and believe me, I do appreciate it very much, so thank you all. When I come back next month, I'll be joined by someone whom you know very well by name, Professor Stephen Hawking. So until then, good night. <laughs>